right, I think we're going to get started. We're very honored to have Dr. Gary Dunnington with us as our Abramson visiting professor this, this year. I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about Dr. Dunnington before his talk this afternoon, and we'll give you a more detailed account of his accomplishments tomorrow before the Abramson lecture. Dr. Dunnington is currently the J.L. Grossfeld Professor and Chair of Surgery at Indiana University School of Medicine, and he's held that position since August 2012. IU is also his medical school alma mater, so he basically returned home, which is kind of fun. He did his residency training in general surgery at University of Arizona. Dr. Dunnington's area of clinical expertise is surgical oncology with a focus in breast and endocrine disease. He's developed two multidisciplinary breast centers, first at University of Southern California Norris Cancer Center and at Southern Illinois University, and served as the medical director of both. He has served as principal co-investigator on research projects totaling greater than $5.6 million, something to work for you guys, and has more than 145 peer-reviewed publications. Prior to taking up the chair of surgery at Indiana, he served as professor and chairman of surgery at Southern Illinois University for 15 years. Dr. Dunnington developed a keen interest in surgical education, and more specifically, education research during his surgery residency. And from that budding interest has become one of the giants in the area of surgical education, having made SIU an epicenter of surgical skills education and education research. And I don't think I could hear the name Gary Dunnington and not think about surgical education, surgical skills training, and surgical research. They kind of are all synonymous and go in there. We're very pleased to have Dr. Dunnington with us for these two days wrapping up with our resident graduation tomorrow, and we'll now hear from him on the topic, how to avoid losing your marvels, even though there's marbles in that picture, and your margin. Dr. Dunnington. Well, thanks very much. It's a privilege to be here. This time of year is always uh, exciting, particularly for those leaving. Um, but the traditions, I'm always interested. There's always the tradition surrounding programs and what's unique. We have our own traditions. At our place, um, it started last weekend. All of the residents and their spouses come to our home for dinner, and they choose five of the faculty that have had the biggest impact on them, and they come with their spouses. And then one of them is uh, selected as the most outstanding teacher at our banquet next Friday night, and after which the residents uh, that are graduating will be uh, out of sight, I'm sure discussing with one of the chiefs, it sounds like you still have a couple more weeks to go, uh, unless you can talk the fourth years into covering for you. But it's nice to see the various traditions. I'm going to talk on something today that has nothing to do with surgical oncology and nothing to do with surgical education, for that matter. But I think it's an important issue at particularly times of transition. I don't know if we have medical students here, but I talk about a lot of these issues with medical students as they start their clinical years. I talk about some of these issues with new interns as they arrive in the next few days. But I think particularly as you uh, make this big transition to practice, it's important to be reminded of a few of these important uh, issues. Clara Papp several years ago at an education meeting made this comment, how do you brainwash someone? Well, you sleep deprive them, feed them bad food, then keep them repeating the same thing over and over again. And basically that just about covers surgical residency. And so all of you understand the grind of surgical residency that uh, has changed a few ways over the years, but still is a challenging issue. Lots of causes of resident stress that you've dealt with, sleep deprivation, depression, anxiety, marital discord, inability to attend to personal needs, work overload, personal debt. In a program the size of ours, we are almost always dealing with at least one or two residents dealing with serious issues around depression. Not that the other residents or many of the faculty would know, but we are fully aware that that is a common issue during these times of stress. Of course, you could not have been present in American medicine in the last few years without hearing the concern around burnout. Our institution has a number of initiatives at the resident level for wellness, at the medical student level, largely driven over the last two years with several high-profile suicides, one medical student and one faculty member, all very recently. Of all the definitions of burnout, this one, I think, cuts to the chase. I think it's very precise. It's really an erosion of the soul 
caused by deteriorations of one's values, dignity, spirit, and will. And in medicine, those things we came into fully appreciating and perhaps over time can be eroded. Well, I have been saying for a long time, despite all the solutions, I really believe in my own practice and I believe in the practice of many surgeons. It's really the solution of mindfulness. I know you've heard that term over and over again, but I think it really is something, and I want to make sure for surgical residents, we're talking about mindful, the second, not the first one. You're all dealing with a mindful at all times, but we're talking about being mindful, and the best way to describe it is just focusing on the present. And that's difficult when there are two cases pending and 40 patients in clinic, and your spouse is calling on the phone, and you're behind on updating your logs and all of those things, it's hard to focus on the present. But mindfulness just means don't look but observe, don't just swallow but taste, don't sleep but dream, don't think, feel, don't just exist but live. So I'm going to give you some things that I have found helpful, and perhaps one or two of them you will find helpful, that may help you in the years to come to avoid this problem of burnout, uh, loss of wellness, uh, erosion of the soul, and here are some of the things I'm going to just mention briefly. Selecting your board of directors, making good choices, never losing the awe of medicine, being sure to preserve margin, and being mindful of the journey, not just the destination. Many years ago, I became a fan of Jim Collins, largely because of all of his leadership le literature, such as Good to Great and many other things. But he said to leaders, and I would say to residents, I think it's really important as you start your career that you develop a personal board of directors. Think of six or seven people that you deeply respect and would not want to look, look let down. Well, maybe you already have a couple of those, but they should be people of diverse backgrounds and perspectives, maybe even some outside of your profession. But the idea is that they would guide you in different areas of your life. You're facing a business challenge, you call your business advisor. You've got a big challenge in research if you go into academic surgery, you've got someone that gives you advice there. The big decisions, the ethical dilemmas, the life transitions, a group of people that you trust and they greatly trust and admire you and importantly you trust their advice. The faces won't mean anything to you, you probably don't know of them, some names you might recognize. Uh, the lower left is Bing Rickers, the longtime chair at Wisconsin. Uh, in the middle below is a person I spent a lot of years with, uh, Tom Demeester of the Demeester score for reflex esophagitis. And then I worked with Roland Fulce, the lower right, who was 29 years the chair of surgery at SIU. Uh, and my predecessor there. Many of the principles I'm going to share with you, I would say more than anything else, I learned from Roland Fulce and went to SIU because of those principles, which at that stage in my career were strikingly unusual. I think the reason we need mentors at all stages of life is because they help us find our blind spots. And I've really been fascinated by the literature around blind spots the last few years. I have an executive coach, um, will always have an executive coach until I retire. And when I have issues, I go to my executive coach. And recently he said to me, you know, I think you've got some big blind spots. Who are your blind spot detectors? I had to think about that for a while, but I have those people now in my practice, my vice chair of business affairs, who we have a relationship that I can say to her, listen, if you see a blind spot, be honest with me. Tell me what it is I'm missing in the big picture. That's what those board of directors are able to do in your life and keep you on, the, on course. The other is choose what makes your heart lead. Now there are a number of places in life that you've had to have these big decisions and you've had to make those decisions. And often it's extraneous things that cause you to make decisions. And that will continue to be the case. And at every step I say to medical students and residents, you know, if you listen to your heart and just choose what makes your heart leap, you'll do okay. If you don't pay attention to other things, so when I'm talking to medical students who've just come on the surgical service, one of the questions I like to ask because there could be so many answers. I just say to them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I start hearing the kinds of things that are influencing their decision, and it's not always uh, what I want to hear. So again, I remind them that whatever you choose, even a surgical career, uh, don't choose a second choice because it's an easier lifestyle, and don't choose anything because of the money, but choose it for the right reasons. It makes your heart leap. Tell you my story, I started out as a resident at the University of Arizona. I loved the VA. It was out in the middle of the desert. So it was a great place to do residency training. I stayed on faculty there because I really was fascinated with educational uh, interest and research. And they unwisely told me as a, C as a chief resident, if you stay on faculty, we'll let you be clerkship director. Well, that's a terrible thing to do to a resident right out of training. Uh, 
Back then, you chose someone that didn't have anything else to do and would willingly take the job. More senior faculty would turn it down. So I said, that sounds great. So they stuck me out at the VA, started my career in the VA, and by the way, it's a wonderful place to start. And so they told me you have to have a basic science research lab if you're going to be a surgeon in the academic sphere. So I decided I'll study multiple organ failure. And they put me in the back corner of the VA in a little dungy laboratory, nobody else there with 400 rats. And for about six months, I killed rats. I infected them and then I killed them. And then I infected them and I hated every minute of it. Because what I was really passionate about was education. And I'll never forget the conversation when I went into my chief of surgery at the VA, a name some of you would remember, Charlie Putman, who was a Tom Starzl protege. And I said, Dr. Putman, I'm making a decision, choosing what makes my heart leap. I want to close my laboratory, and I want to be a surgical educator and do educational research. And I'll never forget his first response. He laughed. He laughed at me, his new faculty member. And he said, well, that's a stupid idea. You should get back to your lab. Nobody ever makes it in that area. It's a dead end. You'll never get promoted. Ten years out of the question, go back to the lab. And being respectful of my seniors, I went back to the lab for six more months, even more miserable than the first six months. And finally, I made a decision and marched into his office and said, listen, I've made my decision. I'm going to be a surgical educator. I'm closing my lab. And that's OK, Dr. Putman. I don't really care if I ever get promoted. I'm fine being an assistant professor for the rest of my life. So here's the decision I had to make. Mice or medical students? And to me, it was an easy choice. I was fascinated by all the things that I kept asking my mentors, why do we do things like that in surgical education? And the answer was always the same. First, they would look at me like, why are you asking? And then, that's just the way we've always done it. Or more later in my career, that's the way they do it at Hopkins. So it must be right. And I really got tired of those answers because even as a chief resident, a first or second year faculty member, I could see all kinds of things that could be so much better. So once I made the decision and announced it, I thought others might be more happy than my boss, but I at least had three different faculty bring me in their offices and counsel me in strong words about how I was throwing my life away and what a terrible decision I was making. So I am speaking honestly when I tell you, choose what makes your heart leap, not what other people tell you you ought to do and the career path you ought to follow. Happens in choice of specialty, choice of residence, choice of, choice of fellowship training, and now you've been struggling with these issues of choice of practice setting and well over the next few years. I want to tell you to never lose the awe of medicine and the healing art. I remember when you start medical school, you can't imagine that would ever happen. And then it starts to sort of uh, be a problem toward the end of medical school. It gets revived at the beginning of a surgical residency, but after five to seven years of grind, sometimes it becomes fairly routine and you don't realize as you walk into the OR and someone's giving you the privilege of opening them up and rearranging their anatomy of what an unbelievable God-given trust you've been given. And so I think it's important for all of us to remember how blessed we are. Keeping the awe involves every day being again mindful rather than mindless and mindless is autopilot. Like when you drove home sometime the last week after a night on call and you arrived at your home and you couldn't recall even how you got there. You don't remember the stoplights or anything else because it was automatic and you were too tired. That's mindless. Mindfulness is about dealing with the patient, the nurse, the colleague in front of you as if nothing else matters because nothing else matters to them. And finally, Pearsall is the one who said, as the title of this talk, patients want physicians that haven't lost their marvels. They really want people who are still in awe of the privilege of practicing medicine. One of the things I think mindful physicians are, they're very aware of their limitations, not just now, but at the end of your career as well. The goal is not always to cure, and often cure is not an option. We really forget that in surgical residency. I watch residents as patients are pronounced terminal on the service suddenly spend much less time with those patients. After all, I don't have anything else to offer them, such as a surgical cure. And what a mistake that is. Bernie Siegel, in a commencement address to a group of students before, went to, to round on patients and said, so I'm going to talk to graduating students today. What do you want me to tell them? And students said, tell them these, these things. Knock on my door, say hello, let me talk first, look me in the eye, and say goodbye. All about the personal side of medicine, about not losing the awe. I've been a reader of the work of Dr. Brand, who's an orthopedic surgeon that spent a great deal of his life working among leprosy colon colonies in India. And he tells the particular story that I've told many times, but it really helps me illustrate what a caring heart is in a surgeon. He took care of uh, one of the missionary's children, who at the time was eight years old, her name was Anne. Anne came to him with a 
terrible dead bowel problem. He resected the bowel, put the, the bowel back together. She came back in about eight days later with sepsis, opened her up, did another bowel resection, did an ostomy, stayed in the hospital, long sepsis, four more operations, and ultimately died. He was so heartbroken by this family that he had become attached to that uh, all he could do was attend the funeral, and he wept in the back of the room. Fifteen years went by, and now Dr. Brand was back in the States on leave and was speaking at this missionary's church. And the strangest introduction, the father of Anne, now got up and said, all of you know Dr. Brand. He needs no introduction. He's the surgeon that wept at Anne's funeral. That's all he needed to say. That's what the family remembered. Not all of the efforts at operating, but his compassion. I presume some of you have read uh, a really provocative book written in the last few months of Paul Kalanithi, the, the neurosurgery residency at Stan, resident at Stanford who died of metastatic lung cancer. And this phrase, when I read it, caught my attention. The cost of my dedication to succeed was high, and the ineluctable failures brought me nearly unbearable guilt. Those burdens are what make medicine holy and wholly impossible. In taking up another's cross, one sometimes get crushed by the weight. I hope you never lose that sense as a surgeon over the coming years. If you're going to avoid losing your marbles, you have to learn to manage your margin. And this is not a term that's original to me, uh, but many of us uh, during residency and during your practice in years to come feel like this, the little Dutch boy who just had a finger in the dike and if, if he pulled a finger out, the whole wall would collapse, those kinds of pressures. Stephen Covey talks about most of us as physicians having an urgency addiction. We've lived for so many years in residency, going from one emergency to the next. That's how we live our lives. It doesn't work well when you go home, however. Your spouses and others have probably told you that over the last few years. And more importantly, if you train residents and you're addicted to urgency, you're a pusher. So now you train residents for this kind of addiction. If you're worried that you may have it, there's a score that you can take, a test you can take. Uh, to score to see whether you have it. I always remind me, myself of this when my wife or some other one says, uh, you know, you're not at the hospital anymore. We often get so caught up in the drama of our lives, we forget we're the ones who created the drama in the first place. Something important to remind us of. I go back to Paul Purcell because he wrote a really fantastic article in the Archives of Surgery a few years ago about the toxic success syndrome. Sometimes happens as you approach chief residency, and then about three or four years into practice when you again gain that confidence that I pretty much know everything I need to know. And it's that concept again, back to mindlessness, a misattribution of your success, a time-focused personality, greater need to achieve than to affiliate. Perfectionism and cynicism are two that I see in residents I work with. A focus on tangible wards and getting to the point that you're living to work rather than working to live. Now, if you're looking at this list of symptoms, you're all wondering, do I have toxic success syndrome? It's an easy diagnosis. Just ask the person who knows you best, would they say, you are a true joy to live with every day? If the answer is something different than that, you could have early symptoms of toxic success syndrome. I had a dinner several years ago with Richard Swenson, who's a physician who wrote this really powerful book on margin. And it really has had an impact on me and the way I live my life, and I think it uh, has had on the residents I train. Margin's the space that exists between ourselves and our limits, and it's in multiple domains. It's in personal and emotional, relational, physical, financial, and all of those areas. The goal is to keep a margin. Don't live right against the margin. It's a recipe for burnout and toxic success syndrome. So he says there are two ways you can live your life. I would say that in my early career, this is the way I was living my life. Because I was told by my mentors, without giving any names, the only thing that matters is your academic career. I'll never forget as a young faculty program director, I said to my then chair of surgery, I was wondering if we might move grand rounds from Saturday to during the week. Because all the young faculty are missing their kids' soccer games. Well, that's the last time I suggested that because the answer was very clear. As long as I'm chair, we're having it on Saturday because that's the way we did it at Hopkins. Sorry about that. Um, and when you become chair, you can do anything you want. And I did. So he said to me later, in reference to that conversation, Gary, don't you know, that's Kim's job to raise the kids. All this Saturday morning soccer stuff, 
you're married to academic medicine. And he felt that way, and it was very clear. And it's why I left the University of Southern California, because I didn't want to live my life like this. So many areas of my life below the line, suffering, uh, clearly not satisfactory, all with an effort to have the highest bar possible for my career in surgery, as much as I love my career in surgery. I would much prefer this way of living. Maybe sacrifice a little on the peaks of that career, academic or private practice, it doesn't matter, but instead keep everything else above the line and live a life that's harmonious and rich and balanced. Now there's a lot of talk about work-life balance. The term is no longer in vogue, so I'm very aware of that, so I have to be careful. It was several years ago and every article was about work versus life. And I particularly want to make a comment to the women in the audience because this caused a lot of uh, raised eyebrows when it first was, uh, was mentioned by Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, but I absolutely believe it. There's no such thing as work-life balance. There's work, there's life, there's no balance. Women face two key challenges men do not. They experience guilt for working full-time, and the more they succeed, the less they're liked. Men often deny that. We shouldn't because it's absolutely true. We've been doing a lot of work in our department now around gender equality, looking sort of below the rocks. Is there anything we're doing that makes it more difficult for either stay-at-home dads or stay-at-home moms, those who may not be in the workplace? So I think this is really a critical issue, and leaders would do well to remember it. When I first became really interested in balance in life or integration of home and work, I went to Barnes and Nobles. We did it back then. We didn't have readers and all the other things. And I found a whole bookcase full of all kinds of titles. And I selected several, preferably from different parts of the world. I wanted an Eastern view, a Western view, all kinds of philosophical views. What does it take to have a life that's integrated both at home and at work? I had my own ideas, but I wanted to reflect what does the literature say? So you don't have to read any of these books. I'll tell you the five things that almost all of them were very clear constitute a balance in life as you start your careers. Here they are. Number one, challenging and fulfilling work. We have that one. We do really well there. In fact, many of my friends over the years who are non-physicians say, you don't know how lucky you are as physicians. You don't have to go to bed at night and think, have I accomplished anything today? As surgeons, we don't go to bed and think that at night. It's easy to reflect what a tremendous difference, more than we even imagine, the difference we've made in people's lives. That's a rich blessing. I often ask beginning interns, so here's the deal. Would you take this job every day starting from 8 o'clock until noon, you dig the deepest hole you can dig. You get one hour off for lunch, and from 1 to 5, you fill the hole back in. You make $1 million a year with annual cost of living increases. Would you take the job? You can see people sort of furrow their brows and they're thinking about it. Those are the ones with the greatest medical school debt. And so I think some are thinking, maybe for a year or two, pay off my loans, and then maybe not so much. So it makes the point. There's more to life than how much it gives you in compensation. It's really a job that daily challenges you and stimulates you. Uh, I often, as I'm talking to medical students about their career choice, I say, make sure whatever you choose, when you're 30 years in, Every day, you're still challenged by something that sends you back to the books. And that's what's rich, I think, about a surgical career. Key elements. Next is strong relationships with spouse, family, and friends. Those get sacrificed during residency, unless they live in the hospital. So it really is important to maintain that sphere of friends, particularly those who knew you before the ill or otherwise effects of surgical residency. And again, can be honest with you, be a mirror to reflect, and be a blind spot detector. Next is attention to health, fitness, and of course the term these days, well-being. Again, it's one of those things that often residents in my era said, you know, I don't do it during residency, but when I get out, then I'm going to join a club and I'm going to get back in shape and get back on a good diet. Uh, Mark, you have the Mark Twain idea in residency. Whenever I feel I ought to be exercising, I just sit down and enjoy doing nothing until the urge passes. And I've known a number of residents who had that sort of philosophy, but uh, this is not the sort of thing you delay and put off until a later date. Recently, we went to, we went to all of our divisions, uh, largely through an initiative of the uh, Institute of Health Improvement, restoring joy in work, trying to get at what makes for student and resident and faculty wellness. And we asked these two simple questions as a way to reflect. What makes for a great day at work? 
What is it when you go home at night, you say, that was a great day? And similarly, what's the pebble in your shoe? What are those things that really make it difficult to keep doing the job? All of us would love to ultimately have a job where we just do the first and ignore all the latter, but at least you can head toward that. Stress reducing hobbies and interests outside of medicine. Again, this was introduced to me by Roland Foltz more powerfully than anyone else in my career. And he reminded me that it was not novel with him. William Osler said years ago, medicine is your vocation. Begin at once the cultivation of some interest other than the purely professional. Have an outside hobby. This guy was a great educator and had this recommendation years ago. Roland Fulce, as I said, for 29 years was chair of surgery at SIU. I've never met a more Renaissance type man. He was a potter, I mean a master potter, two kilns in the back of his home. He was a pastel painter. He was a bonsai master. One of his trees is in the bonsai garden in Washington, D.C. Had a large greenhouse with a collection dating back to the early 50s. He was a woods craftsman. His workshop would have rivaled those you see on TV, making both art and woodwork. He was a master bass fisherman. Most of the faculty lived around Lake Springfield. He taught my kids how to fish for bass. He had a passion around hobbies. I remember going into his office on often Thursday afternoon and asking his secretary, I, I need to talk to Dr. Fultz. And she would say, Dr. Dunnington, don't you know every Thursday afternoon he's out at the kilns at the University of Illinois? That's just what he does on Thursday afternoon. He took medical students at the end of every clerkship to his home, out to his greenhouse, and watched him sort of groom a bonsai tree, talking about the importance of hobbies. It became so powerful there, if you were a faculty member without a hobby, you really better get one. If you came to do residency there, one of you is going to SIU. Who's, you better have a hobby. You better be able to talk about it, because even though he's gone, his influence remains. Get one quickly before you start your colorectal fellowship there. Incorporation of spirituality into life balance happens to be something I value, but it's not just my value. It's in all of the world's literature, incorporation of this. Newsweek several months ago had this article, God in the Brain, How We're Wired for Spirituality. And I love this quote by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. So this necessarily is part of a complete and a full life. I want to close by telling you a story that I think of often, uh, particularly in a life that is often about the next destination. So keep that in mind as I tell you the story. It's a story about two people. One is a, um, a Mexican fisherman, and the other is a MBA graduate businessman of Harvard who happened to be vacationing on this shore down in Mexico. And he watched this fisherman come in off of the lake pulled his boat in and pulled out two beautiful yellowfin tuna. He commented on them and said, how long did it take you to catch those fish? And he said, only a couple of hours. And he asked the fisherman, well, why didn't you stay out longer? You could have caught many more. And he sort of looked puzzled and said, well, why would I want to do that? He said, well, what do you do with the rest of your time? Oh, he said, I have a rich and full life. I sleep in every morning. I play with my kids. I fish a little. I go back home, I take a siesta with my wife Maria, and every night I come into town and play my guitar with my amigos. A rich and full life. And the businessman said, you would not know this, but I'm a businessman and I graduated from Harvard with a degree in business, and could I give you some recommendations? He said, if you would just extend your fishing time to maybe four or five hours a day and triple the number of tuna you collect, eventually you could buy a whole fleet of boats and hire friends to also fish for tuna. And then you could eventually take out the middlemen and buy your own cannery for processing all of the fish. And by this man time, the, the fisherman was really puzzled. All he could see was the work involved. And he said, well, what would I do then? He said, oh, then you sell your enterprise and move to Los Angeles. And it becomes an empire. And then eventually you sell it as an IPO and make millions of dollars. And the fisherman said, well, then what do I do? And the businessman said, well, then you could retire to a little seaside village and sleep in in the morning, play with your grandkids, come in afternoon and do some fishing, and every night come into town and play guitar with your amigos. Destination disease. We're all guilty of it. We work so hard trying to reach the destination instead of enjoying the journey. When I finally finish medical school, when I finally complete residency training, all the things you said now you're going to do, 
when I finally get started in practice, well, when I establish my practice, for those of you going into academics, well, when I achieve tenure, or again, when I pay off my medical school debt, then I will really start to live. I love this quote by Dan Elton. You've missed the point. The journey is the destination, and there's overwhelming evidence that if you're not enjoying the journey, you probably won't enjoy the destination. So I hope you keep those thoughts in mind as you make this really important transition over the next few days and weeks. Thanks again for the invitation to be here. I think we can do some things to ameliorate them and we have huge projects at our place trying to rescue people from the overwhelming work of medical records. We have a big project with heavy investment trying to decrease the number of hours. So we're responding to some of those issues. But I think if you allow those issues to sort of take your joy in medicine, you may have gone into medicine for the wrong reason. And I always get back to this. There's one thing that really hasn't changed in medicine. And that's when you walk in a clinic room and close the door and it's just you and the patient. It's the same when I was a senior resident as it is last week for me. So as long as you keep focused on that unit, which is the most important unit of your future practice, see the others as just sort of things you have to deal with and let the leaders work hard to deal those things. We're doing a lot around RVUs. I know that's something I've heard from young faculty over the last decade. That's all you care about is more RVUs, more RVUs. I don't know what the situation is here. But we had a practice that was almost entirely RVU driven. And I spent all of last night with our leaders uh, designing school-wide. We're doing an entirely new compensation program. For the first time, I think, takes a right turn and goes back the other way. And only about 60 or 70 percent will be for RVUs. And for the first time, a whole set of metrics about teaching and research and citizenship and quality and all of those other things. Uh, and the faculty get very nervous because all they've ever known is how many RVUs do I produce? We have to move away from that. It's going to take some time, but I think we have to, and I think that will help restore the joy of medicine. Yes? You mentioned that during your presidency term, they have one or two students that are struggling with depression that you know about. How do you help those people come to someone or discover them or help take care of them? That's a good question. I, I would guess that um, for everyone we know about, there's probably two or three we don't know about. I would guess that's what you're getting at. And I think you have to have um, faculty and program directors that really develop a personal relationship with residents and communicate right from the beginning. This is more than just surgical training. We're here to make you better people when you finish than when you started. So I think that trust has to be there. But uh, some of us who have been doing this a while pick up pretty easily on clues, especially if it's an abrupt onset, just not quite interacting like they did before. So we really talk to our chief residents particularly and faculty about here are the clues. Here are the things to watch for. Now, obviously, I had some tragic situations in my early faculty that made me more aware of these cues of early depression and other things, drug addiction and some of those other things. But I think it's just to have a group of residents and faculty who are constantly aware of folks who don't interact the way they did two months ago. And I'd rather call it and miss it than to ignore it and a tragedy result. So we're very open about those things and try to remove the stigma. It'll take decades to do that. Uh, but we try to decide, can they continue to function? Should they take some time off? We recently had a, a resident well into internship. She just wasn't coping at all. We said, listen, we're going to be here. We want you to finish residency. You need to go away for about three to four months and get everything back in order. She's now returned and doing extremely well. So we really have to be more aware of these issues. 
Anything else? Yes. Something about toxic success syndrome. That almost got you worried, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I think it's uh, doing a lot of work to improve the interaction between faculty and residents. When you interview for residents, you always ask that question. How, how do your faculty get along with the residents? Do they interact? And in our program, we really want that to be vital. It's a big concern in a big residence. We have 10 chiefs a year, so 60 residents. And so it's even more difficult than 125 faculty. But they all have their individual mentors. Uh, we try to have the residents at each level in our home once a year for just an informal debriefing and over a glass of wine, sometimes they're more willing to say some things that they're concerned about. Uh, I meet with the chiefs every, every month uh, for a session and just say, what's going wrong? What do we need to fix? Any residents you're concerned about? And interestingly, any faculty I should be concerned about. So I think the residents are very helpful in knowing what faculty I need to be concerned about. So it's just it's frequent asking uh, to keep people grounded and aware that uh, these are common issues we all face. And particularly when I see a resident I think one of the most worrisome signs is the cynicism. When they just start to get a little sarcastic and cynical, they're just very close to a full-blown toxic success syndrome. And we have to, we have to address that. Yes? Yeah, it just came to my mind that uh, when we have a scenario that we recognize that there is a resident or a faculty who is suffering from the early signs of toxic shock. <laughs> Pretty similar, yeah. yeah. I think I have that. So, uh, so when you do that, how, the struggle which I face is in my mind's eye is that how do I address that because I'm worried about crosstalk versus gossip. Like, and how do I come over that as an educator? Because, because I'll be honest, I, uh, I felt like uh, I had noticed some people who have that, and including myself as well, when I was a mid-level resident. And I ignored it for a while, but how do you overcome that? Like the crosstalk or the gossip? Yeah, it's easy if they don't need to pull away for a period of time. And there, there are only two people in the program that ever know it, myself and the program director. And so we talk in our regular meetings, any residents in trouble. Uh, and we really try to protect them. The challenge, of course, is when we need to explain that they need to go away for three months. But I think even there, uh, we try to make it just something that someone needs to do. Um, and I think Generally, we have a really supportive resident. I don't have any tricks as to how to prevent the gossip. I don't think there's a lot of that going on. I think uh, everyone realizes they're uh, you know, possible one more serious event away from depression themselves. I mean, these are, these are common problems. And the more we talk about it, uh, we have one of our pediatricians who's now become nationally known by giving grand rounds all over the country of how he was severely depressed and sitting under a tree with a gun ready to kill himself. Suddenly, he thought, maybe I'll give it one more try. And he tells this whole dramatic story of to the end of depression and back, uh, and gives warning signs and things that all of us should look for. And so we do a lot of that in our program as well, just to make sure everybody's constantly aware of it and thinking about it. Like a good camaraderie among them. Yeah. yeah. The other thing we do as part of our wellness program, we spend about $10,000 a year in wellness. Now, some of it is social activity, because the more you can get residents away and interacting socially, the better to form those networks. We have just an unbelievable chaplain who is just a brilliant woman. And she now meets with each individual year, twice a, each year, twice a year. And the first meeting or two she had, people are a little reluctant to open up. We don't allow any faculty there, just all the PGY1 residents with, with her and all the PGY2s. And she tells me, maintains anonymity, but tells me some of the kinds of things that residents start to open up about, and frustrations and concerns and dealing with dying patients. That, I think, has made a big difference in the, the residents' uh, coping. The other thing we started two years ago, and we'll plan to repeat it, we have death rounds. This came from the University of New Mexico. Once a year, we have the chief residents, three of them, select a patient they unexpectedly lost. And they tell the story of that patient, not the surgical side of it, but the emotional side, what it did to them personally, dealing with the family. Uh, you can hear a pin drop in those, takes the place of M&M. We have the chaplain there on that morning. And as that happens, the kinds of comments made by residents who had similar situations, by faculty who suddenly recall 
devastating effects of an unexpected loss and death of a patient. Uh, so again, more of those humanizing kinds of events. I'm not sure we could have too many in a surgical residency. So some of the things we've done. We're, we're still looking for better and more ideas. Yes? Uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry. Some of us have to keep coming in and out. Sure. No problem. The case is still going. Um, but so I was wondering, one thing that's difficult is, um, you know, go, it, it's what we do is inherently hard, going through a surgery residency and then even being a young faculty or faculty member. And, uh, and so there's a good bit of needing to just lean into it because there's no avail, avoiding it. But then, so how do you know when it's a... It, it, even in counseling residents, how do you know? Because it's not always the right say, thing to say, suck it up, you know. But that sometimes, no, that sometimes you work. have to do that, you know. But <coughs> so how, what, how do you? I don't know. How do you find it when it's pathological? You know, I don't have issue with many residents who are who I'm worried they're just not willing to work hard enough. I mean, the kind of people that come to surgical residency day, these days generally have such a powerful work ethic. So I don't have to say very often, you know, you just need to suck it up. You're yeah. just you're just lazy. Uh, I'm much more concerned at the other extreme, that they're so dedicated and so passionate that they lose sight of their own physical situation and home life and relationships and other things. And, and I think it's one of my jobs in the program director, as I said, the new program director, it's a big job. It's not just all the paperwork and the CCCs and all the bureaucracy. Part of it is a daily mindfulness of how your residents are doing as human beings. And it just is a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of watching their interactions and seeing how they're doing. I often can tell at an m and presentation, this resident doesn't sound like they've been sounding the previous year and a half. So just always aware of those things. And just sometimes a simple, everything going OK? And opening that door just a little bit, I'm amazed at how often they take the opportunity. They've been waiting for someone to ask. We don't ask enough in these kinds of really hard-driving professions of our peers and faculty to residents in a location where they can really be honest. How's it going? You know, anything you want to talk about? Everything OK? Um, and I think we just need to do more of it. They don't believe you really want to you tell them the first two or three times you ask. But if you're persistent and keep asking, eventually they actually may open up. So lots of that. Yes? I thought it was interesting. I, I think, I don't know, to me, you probably answer this is like, to me, the biggest thing just seems like the stigma to all of this and like just kind of keep pushing it, keep pushing it. Because I know from our side, like, you know, now millennials and everything, it's kind of considered the snowflake generation. It's like we need safe spaces and everything else. That's a new one. I haven't heard that. Snowflake. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, like, that's, a, that's a term. And they, because they're talking about the colleges during finals, we needed safe space to go cry basically because they were taking finals. And so, you know, you go from the pillars of surgery who were, you know, smoking on rounds, and this is just our life, and this is what we do. So now it, Why do you look at me when you do that? <laughs> so that's why I think, you know, we feel that as a younger generation, we're trying to live up to those. And so, yeah, we're really trying to merge those two mindsets and, yeah, take out the, the stigma of all of this. So is that been like Yeah, that's a really good observation, because I think that would be a reason why residents don't want to complain to faculty, because they wouldn't understand. All I'm going to hear is when I was a resident, you know, when I was a resident. And I really try hard not to say that. I, I just think nothing is worse in a conversation with a current resident than, well, when I was a resident. That's just not helpful. You find it doesn't help with your kids either when I was your age. So it doesn't work in either situation. I, I've actually spent a lot of time reading uh, generational literature and the impact of work on different generations. So I think having a better understanding of those values and an understanding that a different generation's values are not wrong, they're just different. And to ignore them is at our own peril. I mean, we have to be aware of those differences in how we design educational materials, how we design curriculum, how we design performance evaluation. All of those things are really important. You wouldn't respond to feedback as I did as a resident. And we have to be aware of those differences. We're not critical of them, aware of them and understand them. And ask more from you so we do understand them. But I will promise never to use snowflake reference to your <laughs> generation of residents. I'm sure you must have watched out the, the debate between Simon Sinek versus his uh, critiques about the millennial generation. They talk about the millennials and they want to always say that this is the new generation. They are very critical on them. But at the same time, we have to understand why they are. Because we, maybe we created that scenario for them. 
and so like, yeah, just a just a very crosstalk between uh, the different aspects. Yeah, I like what most of Simon Sinek says, the why and all of that literature. I'm not sure I agree with him entirely on, on those issues. I think we make too much of that. Um, it's sort of like all the changes in medicine, but it's still the unit of patient and physician. It's still the unit of it's the old apprentice style, apprenticeship, uh, and we've tried to really get back to that. It's really easy when you develop a really good relationship with an attending because you're spending a lot of time together. About two years ago, largely over issues of autonomy, and I'll mention it in the morning, we created a whole set of apprenticeship rotations. I think that's done a lot to break down the barrier between faculty and resident. I mean, you're literally with that person now for two or three months, one-on-one. -on -one. Sort of understand what makes them tick. Uh, and they learn to trust you and learn from you. So I think there's some things we can do in designing residency try to break down some of these communication barriers between faculty and residents. Good.